Welcome to the Are You Future Ready podcast. Are you curious about technology, innovation, and how you can stay ahead? Then you've come to the right place. In our series, we tap into the minds of people behind innovation. This podcast is brought to you by LR's Product Development and Innovation Center. Hi, I'm Linda Garib, Director of Brand and Communications at Walters Kluwer, based in New York City, and your host of the Are You Future Ready podcast. Today, we'll talk about innovation, trends, and tips on what you can do to become future ready with our guests. Martina Bruder, CEO of LR Germany and the Regional Managing Director for Central Europe, who is joining us today from Cologne, Germany. And Sandra Reger, Head of Legal and Regulatory US, who is joining us today from Reston, Virginia in the US. Hello, Welcome hello. to the podcast, Martina and Dean. Happy to be here. Great. So uh, we have a lot to cover today. Let's go ahead and, and get started. And uh, Martina, I'll start with you. Uh, if you can uh, tell us a little bit, take us to the very beginning. You know, where did you go to university? What did you study? And uh, maybe a bit about how your career aspirations evolved. <laughs> yeah, well, and, uh, uh, I have to say I was lucky at high school because I had just great teachers who became my role models. So I wanted to get into their footsteps and I decided to become a high school teacher or professor too. Um, so I uh, studied, I decided to study German and English language and literature combined with linguistics and uh, education. Uh, I went to Frankfurt, to university, uh, Goethe University in Frankfurt, which was close to where I lived in the UK, where I studied at Coventry University and Warwick University. I went into teaching, yes I did, and I have to say what I loved about teaching was that you see people grow, which is so rewarding, um, but I soon also felt that the repetitive uh, nature of the curriculum was sort of limiting my own development, um, and hence I quite boldly decided to go into business. Right? Um, so I took a training program for management in publishing, which seemed to be the closest industry to my educational background then. But I have to say I didn't stay in publishing for longer than four years. Then I moved on to television, a curiosity driving me. And I worked amongst others for NBC and CNBC. And um, I moved also then from television later to digital here in Germany as their commercial director and their managing director later. Uh, so, you know, my big learning, looking back at my career, so I started in editorial, I went to sales and marketing, I went to general management. So my b big learning in hindsight is that when I started my career, I thought it was a narrow path and a straight road, but it had many pivot points that allows you to grow in very unexpected ways, and that is what I really enjoyed, I have to say. Great, thank you for sharing. And uh, Dean, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, when you were uh, Sure, I, I think I had a very different path than Martina, but I do have a commonality in the sense that there have been a number of pivots in my career. And I think uh, I always wonder whether it's better to know exactly what you want to do when you're 18 years old um, or to learn over time. And for me, it's been very rich to have a kind of learning over time, if you will. I actually went to, I went to Columbia University in New York City, not far from where Linda is right now. And I studied electrical engineering, which was what my father did. Um, and uh, I went into effectively the family business, which was the defense and intelligence industry. Uh, and I worked on satellite systems. And I did that for about four years. Um, and during that time, two things happened. First of all, the Cold War ended, so the, the nature of the defense world changed pretty dramatically. But the second thing that happened was I found myself doing nothing but writing code. I wrote software all the time, and I realized that I really loved that. And so that led to my first pivot into what was commercial software development, writing accounting software, of all things. And I stayed with that for a while, and uh, one startup where we raised a bunch of money and then failed later, I eventually pivoted into product management um, and, and by extension product strategy. Uh, and that then pulled me into marketing, into general management, and I went through a competitor to Walters Kluwer, a BNA, for 13 years, and then found myself about five, uh, five and a half years 
uh, ago coming over to Walters Cooler to work in legal and regulatory. And so that was not a straight path either. Um, and one that was very interesting for me starting my career, very focused on technology and to move from that more to how do we service customers? What are the things that are important to customers and how do we communicate that? I think has been a very interesting journey for me. Um, when we look at innovation happening right now, what are you most curious about? And could some of these innovations be applied to the legal and regulatory space? Yeah, I think that um, the thing that jumps out at me um, when we think about uh, legal and regulatory space is there's a lot of information out there, but the information is typically not uh codified or characterized in a meaningful fashion. Um, so what we have is a person has to be in the loop to to uh, to do any actions on that. And I think what you start, start to already see <clears throat> is the concept of machine learning, being able to identify data, extract data out of um, documents and to be able to then provide analytic analysis on that or use that as a leg up on research. I think you see that in litigation where we see a lot of litigation analytics. So I could say how likely is based on case law history, one motion to be successful or one court to rule in a particular way given a certain fact pattern. So I think you start to see that. I think the thing that's emerging right now that's really neat is the applying the same concept to contract law. So what are the deal points that we've got for a particular type of agreement? Um, and I can go across a whole large body of agreements Whereas right now, typically what's a good contract is in the eyes of and the experience of an individual attorney. So it's a very localized set of knowledge. And I think that the ability to go across a large uh, body of documents, if you will, and to be able to distill based on actual behavior what the, the best practices are and what the variability in some of those practices are is, is, is a fascinating thing. And I think that the logical extension of that, by the way, is also to shepherd, if you will, or to tie back choices that are made to actual risk. So attorneys are famous for saying the, the sky is falling if you agree to this particular clause. And I think that the thing that has not been done at this point in time is to say, does that actually represent itself in, uh, in things that have happened in the real world? If you open up the door, what is the actual dollar cost or euro cost of a particular give on a contract term? So I think that it, that capability of looking at and pulling data out and then starting to correlate that data um, is very, very powerful. And it's it's already starting in the legal market, but I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And Linda, if, if I may connect um, um, that immediately back to the innovations here in our division and R and to the work that is done in the PDI team, if you look at what is done in predictive analytics, we are right there. We are right in, uh, in big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, yeah, or what we do with uh, caseworks construction here in Germany, which is our um, pilot for the legal matter management platform, where we actually address a, a huge um, uh, customer pain point, uh, which is a tons of unstructured data, which a lawyer in a construction um, a law case is uh, confronted with, and we are able to uh, build on these techniques to structure the entire case for him and allow him to control and manage his case. So you see exactly how, how these um, innovations are actually already implemented at, at LNR as we speak. Yeah, I think Caseworks is a great example of that, Martina. I was actually thinking of that when I was doing my uh, little monologue description there. Yeah. Martina, you work with um, leaders in different countries and have customers across Central Europe. Are there any um, common challenges that you see across the different markets or sectors? Well, I think we all have to cope with the... Uh, well, with how to best serve our customers in the digitization process. I think that actually, um, I'm, I'm, we are, well, let, let, let me add, um, even in my, um, in the area which I'm responsible for, um, if you look at uh, a region central, you have huge differences between where we are in the German market with regards to digitization or with a very low level of digitization yet versus, let me say, the Polish market um, or the Hungarian and Czech market where you have very high levels of digitization. Yeah? But what we all have in common is, so how do we best serve our customers to 
go through the challenges they have in digitization. And it's not only about efficiency gains. Dean, you also talked about, you know, the in, it's when you have to be right, yeah, the accuracy of, of, of what you do. Um, and um, and uh, so, so I, what I wanted to say is also, if I tie that back to the COVID situation, yeah, we see that COVID has really accelerated that process now. Yeah, all of a sudden you didn't have access to your 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 your, your library or to your physical goods, and uh, you had to to swiftly move into digitization, even where you didn't think about it before. So for us, yeah, to digitize workflows, to have an end-to-end to to end digital solutions for our customers, that is a challenge um, in all our markets, uh, even though they have these different levels of maturity. I want to move us over to, you know, thinking about more practical insights as some of our, you know, listeners can use. And but process is also a very important ingredient for success. Um, when you think about developing successful innovations, what are some of the key steps that are essential from your perspective? Uh, maybe Dean, uh, if you want to start off. Sure, on this I one. think that there's 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 two dimensions I I like to think about. Um, uh, so McKinsey has the Three Horizons model for innovation, which I think is an interesting read for anybody who wants to take a look at that, which provides a framework for that. But the the net of it is, is I think that. While we use the term innovation to broadly describe a, a big bucket of, of things that we do, for instance, I think that there are near-term and mid-term and long-term uh, types of innovations you get. And when you think about near-term, uh, near-term is the extension of an existing workflow I've got. I'm doing something and I've got an innovation that allows you to do it better. You're still doing the same workflow, basic task. And if you go to the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, you can say, hey, I've got something that's that's completely disruptive and it's a different way of looking at things. And I would say iTunes, for instance, was more of a near-term innovation because what I had there is it's, I'm still having a copy of, of music on a device that I'm listening to. Whereas if you think about Spotify uh, mm-hmm. as a different example to take the consumer market, here I've got playlists, I've got things that are streamed to me. Um, I, I, I was just looking at a case study in the band Metallica um, had its own interface into Spotify and was able to see by city which songs were most popular. So when they went on tour, they used Spotify from an analytics standpoint to pick what the set list was going to be for their shows in different cities. That to me is a longer, further out term um, uh, innovation because it changes the way I look at a particular task. And I think that um, two things about that. One is that the way I approach my innovation development and the way I approach the market differs based on whether it's a a near-term or longer-term horizon. Um, And so I need to be cognizant of that. And then the second thing on that is is that it's it's good organizations typically have a mix. Some of the things I'm doing for a near-term hit uh, are, 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 I've got those in the mix, but I'm still making some longer bets, if you will. And then I think that the the other one that I would say um, is just a general guideline is that it's important to understand your market, um, and in particular, what part of the market is the early market. So not everybody wants to try something new. And we see this, uh, for, for people of my age, we see this with social media. Some people are will proudly state that they don't have any social media accounts. Some people spend all of their time on social media accounts. And I think that understanding who the early market is and how it is that you're able to reach and work with them is essential when you're trying to work on innovation. There are certain law firm customers of mine that will never be the first, the second, or the third person to buy um, a particular product. And so those are not the people I focus on when I'm building innovation. So I think those are two kind of things, the, the, the set of horizons and understanding that and also understanding what the dynamic of your market is and figuring out how to reach the early market. Mm-hmm. Martina, did you want to add anything on any essential uh, steps for for yeah. innovation? Yeah, actually, I think I, I would because listening to Dean, you know, I, I um, well, for me, I think it's when we talk about innovation. Yeah, you know, we 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 are all very much in luck with the creativity of that. Yeah, and you think there's a genius at work, and all of a sudden you have that this one. A unicorn idea, yeah. And um, first of all, the innovation process is team play. 
It clearly is. So the winner's routine is very true here. And as you pointed out rightly, Linda, it's a process which you clearly have to follow. And for me, I have to say the part that the customer discovery part is the essential part of the innovation process. And I know that I'm cutting out a, 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 a part of it, yeah. but why is that? Um, because in my own history, uh, I've seen it myself it during my time at the startup, you fall in love with it, your idea and you're so blind to, to, uh, to what, what uh, dangers that, that others might not be ready for it or don't share your excitement. Yeah. So it's not about you and your idea, it's about, it's about the, the, the person whose problem you want to solve, yeah, the, the, it's about your user. What does he or she need? Uh, what, what, and also, yeah, how do you also, if you know what he and she needs, by the way, don't forget that you also need to have a, um, a go to market process uh, ready and a business model ready, yeah, but still in that customer discovery process, uh, that is where you actually have to listen, where you have to put yourself and your idea to the test. And where you have to be really strong enough to pivot when it turns out that that is what you need to do. Yeah, I, I, I agree just to echo that. I think that we get caught up sometimes and, and just get enamored of the, the cool idea, right? And we have all had this in our personal life in some fashion, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and innovation has to solve a problem. And it has to solve a problem that is relevant to our customers, and so when we are innovation in search of a problem, that is a, a, a stop sign in front of us. Um, and I think that's the other thing is that, uh, and this was the reflective of the startup where I, I think raised about $30 million and then went under, which is a sign of the times in the late 1990s. I don't think I was the only person that did that, but um, you have to understand when to stop and when to pivot, right? And I think that was what Martino was saying there is that there are some things that, are, that, that, that they don't play out as being good ideas no matter how much we love them. So it's important to stop. Um, and, and as a salesperson would say, the best sale that you don't close is the sale that you don't close in the first 30 seconds. Because mm -hmm. you want to spend as little time on something that's not going to be fruitful as possible. So, uh, but uh, have you experienced that also, Martina, in terms of the, um, the, the or propensity to want to continue forward, even though there may not be um, a value at the end of the day? Yeah, well, I, I clearly have experienced that in my own uh, in my own personal history that we did not find the the right moment to stop. That is when I was as an, as a as a startup. Yeah, and um, actually, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I want this to be a very humble anecdote, but uh, in two thousand <laughs> eight. Uh, I was uh, the proud managing director of a startup, uh, which was um, actually uh, which had had a, a, a German French Netflix equivalent in the market. Yeah, uh, why is that a very humble story? Uh, well, if we look at Netflix at that time in the 19s, they were sending DVDs and Blu-rays to their subscribers. Yeah, um, they only went into video on demand and streaming in 2007. Uh, went international in 2010 and only crossed the ocean to come to Germany in 2014. And there we were in 2006 and thought, you know, we skipped the entire process and go right into streaming. Um, and you know what? The market didn't exist. Uh, we were excited, but nobody else was. And uh, yeah, if you want to be nice and gentle with us, you can say we were ahead of the curve. Um, if you want to be brutally open and direct, we didn't do our homework. Yeah, so we didn't do the customer discovery, and we didn't pivot when we should have. Have. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's a great story, though. Yeah. 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 And by the way, as you as you mentioned, the music industry, uh, Dean. <laughs> so, with my as I said, my my career path is a very, it, it's not narrow and uh, straight. It's rather uh, broader. And um, I went into the music industry in 1999. And my big learning from there is very, very brief, which means, you know, don't wait for others to disrupt you. Yeah, be bold and disrupt yourself. Because in 1999, which was the very year I entered the music industry, Napster was founded. And Dean, you just explained how to what extent our consumption of music has changed. Yeah. yeah. So uh, to your question, yes, uh, Nick and I, uh, Dean and I, we're very much aware that you must not be too much in luck with your ideas, and uh, and and uh, yeah. But on the other hand, we are also both big, big advocates of um, of um, courageous innovation. 
Great. So I want to pivot to our uh, last segment here of Are You Future Ready? What advice would you give listeners about becoming future ready? Any thoughts uh, you want to leave our listeners with today? Yeah, actually, Linda, if I make that simple, I say stay curious. Yeah. But I, I would like to add something to that. I, I think that sometimes we are... Well, I think for me, creativity and is a is a much much broader concept, and, uh, and sometimes I think we are focusing ourselves too narrowly on uh, on what we do. And uh, so, when I say stay uh, stay curious, I also mean stay curious outside of your immediate interest area, um, an area of expertise. Talk to others, listen to others. A, a, an example is. Um, um, a friend of mine is a philosopher, and she just published her new book, which is about the innovation of thinking, which is, you know, the question of how do we have to adjust our thinking to embracing the changing global society. Yeah. So I know that this may pretty, be pretty far off in our podcast here, but I really mean it that we, we have to be really broad um, in, in, in absorbing, um, um, uh, broad and open-minded uh, to not limit ourselves uh, too much um, uh, and uh, and limit our ability to think and to be creative. Yeah. Um, on a much more uh, pragmatic view, uh, I would of course say, you know, have your ideas challenged. Yeah. Pitch your ideas to your colleagues. Pitch them to your managers. Go to hackathons. Yeah, and do whatever you can to to bring your ideas to life and put them to the tests with other uh, high energy and uh, passionate people, that's the best thing you can do. Yeah, I really like that point. And, you know, sometimes folks think they have an innovative idea, but they're not sure, you know, what's the next step. So I think that's uh, some really good advice there. Um, So good. So Dean, do you have any final uh, thoughts on being future ready? I love Martina's point about stay curious. You know, I think, it, and I think it's honestly, you know, a, a life lesson as much as it is an innovation lesson. I think as we get older and we go through our career, um, staying curious keeps the magic in the work that we do. Um, and I think it keeps us motivated and pushing forward. And, and I think that I cannot recommend that enough uh, is, is to, to maintain a curiosity or, or about the world around you. Um, if you you know, when we think about root cause analysis to take like a lean manufacturing model, uh, the the rule is that you ask why something has happened and you ask why for five times in succession as you get each answer. And eventually you get to the true answer and the root cause. And I think so many times in our lives and our work that we do, we accept things at face value without asking kind of that why, that curiosity. And I think that that's so powerful to, to try and dig in and understand uh, what the motivation for this is, why somebody does something in some way, why it is set up that way. And a lot of times what we find is that after you go through that second or third why, the reason doesn't make sense anymore. And so I think that that's, that's a great, great type of thing just to, to keep that curiosity. Uh, Martina, Dean, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast and speaking with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Linda. It was fun. Thanks, Dean. Thank you for listening to the Are You Future Ready podcast. Stay tuned for the next episode and make sure to subscribe to our Walters Kluwer channel on SoundCloud.